All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you guys for joining us. Our last um, conversation here with the series, How the House Was Built. It's a bittersweet ending because it's obviously, an it's been an important series and important conversations have taken place. And we've been joined by incredible presenters. Um, but the hope here is right that this is just the beginning of, of what we hope to be a, a journey of learning and also action. And we are very fortunate to be joined by the Dr. Ayana Smith. And um, she's going to be presenting and teaching us really a, a little bit about um, the problematic nature of um, racism within the health field, um, but also just her experience and her journey as, as a professional. And before we start with that, we'll also have Lori Lead, so to speak, in contributing to some history as well about the topic. All right, Chrissy, do you want to start with our community agreements? Yes, I will. So these are our community agreements that we like to start each of our sessions with. And these are kind of things to keep in mind as we're having an open conversation um, with folks from different places and different personal experiences. So just to remember to always speak from your own experience, to focus on the personal and not on others. Wait, W-A-I-T, why am I talking or why am I not talking? What is said here stays here and what is learned here leaves here. Seek growth rather than closure. Acknowledge those outs, ouch and oops moments. Uh, feel free to experience discomfort, that's how we grow. And be curious before you are critical and be explicit with your thoughts, not your language. And this is special thanks to the Space Collective uh, that put together this original list of agreements. All right, Trey. And as always, our Ubuntu philosophy, which guides and grounds us, and it reads as follows. We are made to live in a delicate network of interdependence with one another. A person is a person through other persons. A solitary human being is a contradiction in terms. A totally self-sufficient human being is ultimately subhuman. We are made for complementarity. I have gifts that you do not, and you have gifts that I do not. So we need each other to be fully human. Desmond Tutu. And so with that spirit and philosophy, I would like to offer the floor to Lori. Thank you, Trey, and thank you, Dr. Smith, for joining us tonight, and to Chrissy for that wonderful introduction. It's always actually, it always it's such a grounding um, feeling kind of starting these conversations in this series, and I'm so thankful to be here and grateful to be here with you all today. Um, so my name is Lori Pastriak. I'm the Director of Interpretation at the Fairfield Museum and History Center, proud partner here with, with Ubuntu for these, this series and this program and hopefully many more in the future. Um, but Trey asked me today to talk a little bit about the, to offer some historical context on kind of the history of sciences, social sciences, pseudosciences, and um, my personal background um, was that I first started uh, working in museums as more of an anthropologist, an archaeologist, uh, working for tribal nations here in Connecticut um, in their museum, as well as uh, archaeology on the reservation and sites associated with the tribe away from the reservation. And so I have a really kind of interesting background in understanding anthropology and its roots and it's very uh, systemic racist roots um, with the uh, big picture of studying each other, attempting to study ourselves within the world in which we live in, starting in the 17th century, 16th century, when the world was all of a sudden starting to re reflect on the sciences, understanding where we all live and how we all live in this big picture and trying to fit things into categories, trying to make things make sense, the hierarchy of the world, what is above what, what is below what. And out of that um, history and the sciences, social sciences, pseudosciences, things like archeology, span medical anthropology, paleoanthropology, eugenics, which, you know, I, I'm gonna use a lot of air quotes in this conversation. 
but scientists just like us all um, are trying to see themselves and the world objectively exploring this world but at its base you know that that's a tough thing to do and it can be very even especially in earlier centuries somewhat naive as all of our studies are influenced by our current worldview right the biases that we have and of course, uh, you know, we always struggle with trying to fit things in these perfect categories. And, you know, scientists are, are not, especially historical scientists are not, uh, you know, they're, they're dealing with that too. And when we're struggling with concepts of race, um, it, it became very easy to propose misleading, erroneous explanations of racial differences. And scientists in Europe and the Americas who are studying quote unquote race science or scientific racism, which is really the belief that humankind is divided into separate and unequal races. And not only that it is separated is that there is quote unquote empirical scientific evidence that exists to support or justify that racism, that discrimination, that inferiority or superiority. And even this is this is not um, this has not gone away. So this started in the 15th century, 16th century, and it's even you see it today at the far right, um, like the you know unite the right uh, um, at Charlottesville back in 2016, in 2017, in 2018, in these consistent kind of ideas of racial sciences. Um, and not only did this work just study, right, it was legitimizing and validating and validating things like slavery, Jim Crow statues, anti-immigrant legislation. This was the work of eugenics to really justify our prejudices, advocate programs and policies that were aimed at solving the nation, where it's America, whether it's in Europe, where it's anywhere, by ridding society of inferior, quote, Unquote, again, those air quotes, those inferior racial traits. And, you know, this started off, you know, I mean, this has been going on for 400 years, right? 500 years. This isn't new. This, these are things that have, you know, come up out of nowhere just in the 20th century. These are constructs that are based on race as a social construct, and then science is there to prove it, right? To say, no, there's genetic background for this. Um, the man, the Carl, Carl Linnaeus, who is a scientist, um, he's a physician, botanist, zoologist in the early 18th century, the guy that gave us the, that binomial nomenclature for animals and, and flowers and plants. He also, not only did he do that, but he classified humans into different subgroups. He basically started saying, oh, every every species there are five different species and each one based of course on skin color ethnicity really was about putting people in hierarchy of humanness or support superiority based on race so this is the early 18th century and some of his categories i mean this is this is 1720 we're talking about here um, and I'll, I'll just read these off because they were shocking to me. You know, as a reminder, I actually went back to my college textbooks to pull this stuff together. I was laughing with Trey earlier, so I brought back my notebooks. Um, but Linnaeus, you know, categorized people, uh, races into things like the Americanus. So we're talking about Native uh, Americans here um, as those, of course, he would give it a, a physical description, but then also said that they were stubborn, zealous, free, painting themselves with red lines and regulated by customs. The Europeans, the white, right, were long hair, blue eyes, gentle, acute, inventive, covered with close vestments and governed by laws. The Asiatic, the black hair, dark eyes, the are, but they're severe, haughty, greedy, covered with loose clothing and ruled by opinions. The Africanus, those that are black. Um, <laughs> we've got females without shame. So we're starting even to get into, you know, gender specifics, crafty, sly, lazy, cunning, lustful, careless, um, and governed by caprice. So this is, 1720, we're dealing with early 18th century already, you know, defining the hierarchy, defining the classes, trying to fit things in by science with the arguments that these, this is the way the system works in the world. 
Um, this has not gone away. I can go name white male scientist after white male scientist that goes on about proving and reproving the science behind this. Um, oh my gosh, I could, I'm not going to give them their names even credit because it's just the way it is. But you know, you also have then the comparisons of whites to, of course, being the master race, the Aryan race. We're jumping into the 18th, 19th, and 20th century here, where this, of course, is the roots of Nazism and um, Germany and the work of Germans um, with the description of Aryans, white as the master race, and all of those elsewhere are even different subspecies. So humans become not even the same species. Um, dependent on race. And this is all, of course, quote unquote, based in scientists. These are written about in scientific journals over in the air. Um, you know, there's definitely, you know, predispositioned opinions that are happening here with science to quote unquote prove, right? So this objective view isn't necessarily objective. Um, you've got um, then jumping, of course, into the 20th century and Nazism. There's also what's known as the creation of the first society for the promotion of racial hygiene. So this is where you start to see immigration acts based on an actual policy based on race. Um, our own American Immigration Act of 1924, which looked to lock out Asian cultures from coming into America. And then, of course, the, the, the pain and the realization of the Holocaust and anti-Semitism, um, as well as eugenics. You know, again and again and again, science, quote unquote, scientists who are just searching for ways to prove hierarchy, to prove that white is uh, superior, black or Native American or Asian or whatever is non-white are inferior has happened time and time again over 400 years. These are not constructs that we can escape now in our medical profession. It is based on history and I'm sure Dr. Smith will certainly enlighten us and, and just like what is, is happening and what has this given us today? Um, this systemic racism that exists not only in the medical field, um, but ways that scientists even now today who are on the fringe are trying to cloak their racist views in more palatable language and concepts. Um, and again, these things are coming up in the far right uh, today, um, appearing again in the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. And I will say in the museum field, it is something that we struggle with time and time and time again. Museums themselves were um, created um, generally by the social white elite. And so our collections and the stories we tell reflect that. How does that relate to Fairfield and what we have today existing in our museums? Things like Yale, uh, the Connecticut Historical Society. Um, what happens is, is that as Native Americans, especially from our local area, as well as across the United States, were studied as curiosities. They weren't given the same treatment as preferential treatment um, as, as humans. They were looked as second-class citizens, second-class species. And as such, collections in museums were treated that way. Native American human remains, um, as well as burial goods, were dug up by the, the hundreds um, in the 19th and early 20th century. And without things like the Native American Graves Repatriation and Protection Act that the federal government, which is not perfect, um, but did put into action um, in the 90s, um, those human remains would have um, studied as medical specimens without permission, without acknowledgement, but as second-class citizens. And so we think about medical anthropology um, and we think about today how bodies are um, respected or non-respected. It's really important to acknowledge that all that all comes from these centuries of constructs that have been given down to us today. So that is your <laughs> medical racism in a very short historical context. And I hope I did it justice because I'm telling you, man, I brought those college textbooks back <laughs> for that conversation. So thank you, I'll Trey, I'll, I'll hand it back over to you to introduce Dr. Smith. Lori, you did an, an exceptional job. 
you did your homework. Thank you for bringing those books out. I appreciate you so much for that. Um, hey, without further ado, I'm just grateful and honored that uh, Ayana, Dr. Ayana, you were able to make some time for us and to contribute to our efforts to educate the people of Fairfield here and beyond. Um, folks, please help me in welcoming Dr. Ayana. Thank you. And that was a really wonderful intro because I think it's important to think back to how far and how deep this does go. This is really almost the fabric of historical medical history is this this sort of othering that we have done as and I say we as a medical system um, because I I will kind of touch on this but I do think it's important that everybody even if you are a, a provider of color acknowledges your role in this entire system and kind of how we also have to resist um, even though we are both the subject and the 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 purveyor of some of these acts. Um, so I I really appreciated how you really brought this back to, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, another thing to that I was thinking about as you were talking was, and you know, we can think about how this plays in, and I'll mention this again as, you know, thinking back to early, um, you know, AD right. In different communities who had their own forms of medicine in whatever way that was, whether your community saw bloodletting as, you know, as a form of treatment, or you had more herbalist communities, or, you know, you were, you know, whatever, whatever sort of like your culture and community used as medicine and healthcare, um, that became, we as we've moved towards a more quote unquote Western, I'll use some quotes too, because it's like, what does that even mean, right? A more Western society, we've moved away from like this decentralized form of healthcare and medicine and have created standards which have created healthier people, but it also um, has created a, a platform in which people can shame others for kind of their historical and cultural um, practices that they've performed. You, you mentioned even Native American folks and the sort of like ideals behind things that they, they provide as healthcare for their community. So those are all things that I was thinking about as you were talking of how we, almost in everyday um, medicine and everyday healthcare, are contributing to that no matter what we look like and who we identify as. So I think it's important to think back even as far as 500 years ago, um, we're thinking about um, medical racism. So I really appreciated that. I will introduce myself just a little bit here. My name is Ayana Smith. Um, I am from Cleveland, Ohio. I'm actually back in Cleveland practicing now. Um, I wanted to do medicine probably my whole life. Um, a lot of that stems from watching women in my family be the center of everything. You know, we were the, the decisions on what food our family ate, we were the decisions on when people went to the doctor, how we went to the doctor, how we communicated with the doctor. I thought that women were really kind of the change point um, for if people were at their healthiest or not. And that is a lot of how women performed in their families, but also what was done to them societally um, that would prevent them from being at their healthiest. So I kind of always knew I wanted to be an OBGYN. And so here I am, I'm doing that, you know, trying to, to make some change in that avenue. Um, something that I think is, you know, kind of thinking about women, I think in almost every single facet of healthcare, women, you can trace things back to women. Um, and in a lot of communities of color, we didn't have patriarchal societies, you know, looking back, there were a lot of matriarchal societies um, in, in communities of color, you know, across the globe. And I think there's a reason for that. Obviously, we're like life bearers and, you know, and decision makers and also caretakers. There's a lot of that sort of um, uh, those sort of behaviors that are reflected in women. And so I would love for us to think about, you know, the intersection between racism and sexism and how that works um, in healthcare too, especially for communities of color. Um, so the way that I, I, I was really thinking about, you know, what, would, what should we talk about today? And kind of, I was looking through a, a lot, what a lot of your talks have been focused on and really the central theme of how do we combat racism in healthcare or how do we combat structural racism or divisive networks um, that contribute to race. There were so many things that were popping in my head about what am I doing 
wrong or what is my what are the systems that I'm participating in doing wrong and then how do we make small actionable changes as individuals and then how do we make larger systemic changes that may or may not be something we as individual people can control but sort of demanding almost like how things are in politics where you can cast your vote and you can also try your best to have like almost an upstream effect for the larger decisions that are made for our country I think it works very similar for the healthcare institution before I get to some of those ideas that I think we can all actionably do, um, I wanted to give another resource that I think is really great and kind of easy to read that I love. And I, I it's a book that I probably will reread many, many times throughout my life. It's called Medical Apartheid. If you've never read it, it's a really great choice um, for kind of getting a very long and large landscape of how medical racism has progressed over time. Um, the author digs into uh, kind of like with the spread of colonization, how medical racism has evolved all the way up until today. Um, she kind of leads into uh, Tuskegee experiment, eight, the AIDS epidemic and you know, leading into so like medicalization of, of like the pharmacology on our, on our TVs and in our commercials and those sorts of things and touching on how over time these large moments in history we can re we can look at and see where where people I would say mis misstepped but it's really a little bit more than that purposefully um, crafted black people particularly in this country in the history of this country um, into sort of the oppressed the oppressed group in um, in healthcare. So medical apartheid is a great resource to start with. Um, it is, it's lengthy, but you can piece it out. Each, each chapter has a completely different theme. So it's, it's really palatable in that way. Um, certainly starting there would be wonderful. Um, another thing I, I wanted to do is kind of like talk about some some really poignant and pertinent um, issues today that we're dealing with. And like I said, since we're talking about women, we can start um, a little bit back there. Um, before I get there, there was recently, if you're someone who's on Twitter at all, which I actually am not, but I heard about this a lot. Um, I think it was last week or the week before, the American Medical Association has a podcast that um, they've been putting out regular episodes and the editor of their uh, medical journal and uh, another regular podcast host did an episode that really offered this idea that there are no racist doctors that exist and that structural racism is not really a thing that we should be saying. Um, and it was very obviously controversial and had a lot of people up in arms. I think that, that what I wanna offer is that it is so important to recognize that even if you do not think that you contribute to structures of racism, we all do, um, and particularly if you don't think it exists, you certainly do. <laughs> that, that is when a patient walks into my office, if I think that the way I look, the way they look and their experiences and my experiences aren't contributing to our 15 minute interaction in the office, then I've already lost. Um, I have, I've done a disservice to them immediately. And so even if you are not a person of color, recognizing that you are somebody that just by your existence can contribute to someone's trauma or can contribute to someone um, not getting the experience that they are expecting or looking for, or hoping for in this particular field, um, that, would be a, that would be a mistake. I think even, like I said, even people who are providers of color are contributing to those things. And so acknowledging it, verbalizing it, those are all places to start that we can all do um, and actually our acts of revolution to say like, this is a real thing and how can I uh, work against it and how can my neighbor work against that? So I wanted to bring up that because I was like a hot topic in the news last week. So if you haven't heard about it, you can look it up and um, be as upset as I was. <laughs> Uh, so just to move a little bit into like a little bit of a global, global picture with women, um, there are some things that I think, some principles as an OBGYN I try to carry with myself regularly because I think these are things that um, we, we don't think too much about or we have, see ourselves tunnel visioning in, in healthcare and in medicine. And if we allow ourselves to take a step back and realize how our language, even if well-intentioned, um, is contributing to uh, to the disservice of our patients, then we are actually moving things forward a lot far, further than we would think. For example, you know, when you think about OBGYN, people always talk about, um, you know, we want to provide access to contraception. 
And we want to make sure that women are not having children and, you know, in this like increasing rate. And we want to give black women a chance and not have them just reproducing, reproducing, right? There's this concept of reproductive justice that I really like to remind people that I'm working with and sort of people that are coming up underneath me is that maybe you are talking to a patient who wants to have seven children. Um, and the idea that shutting that down um, because you think, I can't let this black woman, you know, be a, a, a victim of the system and, you know, have all of these children, et cetera, et cetera. You actually might not be contributing to that woman's reproductive justice. You are probably working underneath judgment. Um, and so communication and being on the same page with patients is huge. And this is something um, that I think we get sort of in this like uh, social justice, we put on our social justice hats and we say we really got to provide access and we've got to do everything we possibly can for each person, but without actually acknowledging that, yes, Black women are a collective, but each person is an individual, right? And that our goals are not the same. And culturally, our goals might not be the same. Um, you know, if you are looking at a, a woman who's you know, an immigrant from another country, right? And she's coming here for better opportunities for her family. That doesn't mean she wants a small family with two and a half children and a white picket fence. It just means she wants to have her large family in America. Um, and those are things that contribute to feeling as though people are not getting equity um, in their healthcare because we're really trying to make everybody equal, which is not what we wanna do. We wanna provide an equitable platform for everybody to feel um, and experience health. So thinking about those types of things that like we're, we're really social justice warriors here, but we might be working against um, the patient and ourselves by really pushing forward some of those narratives. Um, and similar with abortion care. Um, those are things that we want to provide access. We want to provide access, but are we pushing this on people or are we, and are we only allowing access to certain types of women? How are those questions in our head and how is our advocacy really um, playing a role into whether or not someone can get full um, and equitable care? Um, so another thing that since it's Women's History Month, I want to bring up is that, and you'll find this sort of reflected in a lot of these books that will discuss um, the history of, of uh, Black people in, in the context of healthcare in America. For OBGYN, we're, we are a field that was um, really built upon the, the backs of Black women and particularly black enslaved women, a lot of the innovative surgical procedures that we do, even obstetrical care and a lot of the tools that we use were really developed on um, unwilling participants um, and truly by torturing people. Um, and I'm, I won't name the person who's considered the father of modern gynecology for all his innovations, but I will name the woman who um, he conducted a lot of his studies on. Her name is Anarka Westcott. Um, she was an enslaved woman that went through many, many, many surgical procedures, uh, experimental procedures without anesthesia um, in the name of science. I think, you know, Laura, you talked about this a lot, this sort of uh, in the name of science, what are we doing to people um, to move the field forward without thinking about people as human beings. Um, and a lot of that was built out of the idea that which I'm sure many of you have heard that black people experience pain in different ways than white people. That we have a higher pain tolerance or, you know, if we're complaining, it's not no more analgesia, they're fine, they're fine, that sort of thing. And this, this woman um, and amongst many others was tortured uh, for science. And a lot of the things that we do today, every single day and the tools that we use were developed by the people that were experimenting on her. Um, and so I just offer her name up as, as in Women's History Month just to remember that a lot of the things that are wonderful for science have actually um, have really sorted past uh, and uh, certainly were built out of the sacrifice of women who or and black people that were unwilling. Um, and that kind of brings me a little bit to this, this what's probably the hottest topic of the last year and a half, which has been the COVID-19 pandem pandemic. Um, and then now the development of vaccinations that we are trying to roll out to the entire country. And I probably get questions about the COVID-19 vaccine <laughs> and the, the various forms like every other day you know, from people that I have, you know, do not know anything about. And these are not even my patients. These are people from the internet. 
Um, when I got my vaccine, I actually had many people, and this is a, a really important, I think it was an important wake up call for me. I had many people messaging me online asking if the government paid me. And if, because I was a black woman, did they pay you to, to get this vaccination? Did they pay you to post about this and talk about this? And at first I was like, oh, I wish, right? <laughs> like, I wish I got a paycheck, <laughs> you know, that'd be kind of nice. But in reality, what was really coming to the forefront for me was that there's so much distrust for the healthcare system and for what we as healthcare providers are offering to the general public that black people couldn't imagine that a black provider would sign up for anything that seemed new um, and uncertain. And that the only way I could be taking this vaccine is if I were paid by the government. And what I, what I think we should do in encouraging our family, our friends, or anybody who is kind of engaging in a conversation with us about the vaccine is for one, acknowledging um, people's concerns first and foremost. You know, if people say, you know, the government will poison us, the government is putting a chip in there, the government is, you know, wanting to experiment on Black people. I understand your concerns, and you would be more than correct to look back at history and see the patterns um, that have really unfolded in medicine not in the far distant past uh, that have directly been results of or you know consequences of experimentation on black people. Um, but I also think that it's important for us as people to break down some of the things that did happen in the past and contrast them to what is happening today. One of the you know big studies or big events in history that people like to cite, um, for the COVID-19 vaccine is the Tuskegee experiment. And what I want people to recognize the difference, and I'll explain a little bit what that was if you've never heard of it before. But the Tuskegee experiment was about a 40 some odd year long experiment um, that the American government did um, perform on black men in the South that were actually syphilis positive. So they had most of them, except for the control groups had a positive syphilis diagnosis. The, 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 what was wrong about the study was that the government promised healthcare to these men. They promised them, you know, like treatment as long as they could run some tests on them, those sorts of things. They never informed these men they had syphilis and allowed them to remain latently um, positive and develop all the sequelae of syphilis just to see what would happen basically. And syphilis is a very debil debilitating disease if, if allowed to progress, but also incredibly treatable. I mean, like, like just penicillin, <laughs> something that like one of the oldest medicines of all time. And they knew the treatment and they purposefully didn't tell these men so that they could watch the progression of syphilis over time on the body and see what would happen. Um, unfortunately, this impacted women, of course, because these men went home to their wives and their families and had children and, and, you know, had sex and all these things. And here we are now impacting an entire community where we had 400 men who were, in, who had positive diagnosis. Now we have potentially thousands of people um, impacted. And that is a true crime, right? It's like truly going against the tenets of medicine. And this was just in the thirties, forties, fifties, sixties, seventies. Um, the difference between that and what the government was doing there and where I think, um, you know, we need to engage people in a conversation about COVID-19 vaccine is that this is an opportunity to not have medication withheld. Um, this is an opportunity and I think people can take a look online and just sort of look around and see that when the opportunity for vaccinations was um, was offered to the general public or starting to be, we had white people lined up down the street ready to get their vaccine, almost like I want to be first. Don't don't miss me, you know. And meanwhile, at that time, black people were still on the I'm never going to do that. I think that everyone should have the choice on whether or not they want to take any treatment, any medication. And I, I would not actually be the provider that would tell you to get it um, without 
thinking about it, talking with your healthcare provider, talking with your family, recognizing your own behavioral patterns in this pandemic. But I do want people to recognize that this is an opportunity to not let the medical system um, let you down by not explaining what this is um, and allowing you to make the decision informed. When you know we've had opportunities in the past to be treated and not been informed by information, this is one of those times. And I don't want the black community or communities of color to miss out on an opportunity that they have the choice to take just because in the past, um, the opposite was true. We were, things were withheld from us. We now have an opportunity to get something and if you want to, to engage in it. Um, there's, I could talk a lot about the, the vaccine and COVID and kind of what I think about it personally. But I, like I said, I don't think that everyone should get the vaccine if they don't want to, if that's a personal choice and you're, you as an individual no matter who you are allowed to um, take whatever treatments and engage in healthcare the way that you want to. But I just want black people and also people who are adjacent to um, communities of color to recognize that this is a time to not let people go uninformed. That is actually the crime here would be to, to not let black people have the access and the information to what this could do for them and their family um, and just say, well, they're not gonna take it. And almost like, here's more for the white people, you know? <laughs> So it is, it is something that like, it's a, it's almost like a flip experience here. And, and it is, um, it's an opportunity for all of us to in, in, engage in education and understanding as opposed to just writing people off and letting that crime wash over our community. Um, so a couple of things I, I think that when I'm thinking about sort of like what we can do as individuals and what we can do as a structure um, and we're in sort of combating racism and combating uh, these, these systems. I kind of want to talk about the individual first because I think that's something that we can all really do. Um, and then I can maybe speak a little bit larger in what I envision and what I see for uh, for the system and putting the responsibility on the system, which is really probably the answer, to be honest, <laughs> as with most things, putting responsibility on the system is, is really where we need to be. But we can all as individuals make, you know, make choices um, that I think can contribute to the, the health and wellness of communities of color. So if you're thinking of yourself, if you are a person who identifies as black or a person of color, um, what you can do as a patient or what you can encourage this community to do as a patient, because this is really where you as the individual can put the fire underneath your provider face to face. For one, asking questions is huge. I think that we often are, as a community, are feeling as though we don't need to or are afraid to ask questions of the provider who's sitting with us. The person is wearing a white coat. It's scary. You're sitting in a room and they're saying words you don't understand. And it's easier to say, yes, doctor, I get it, you know. I don't want you to yes me. I want you to ask me to explain that to you and not in a medical way, explain it in a way that is digestible. Um, I remember probably two years before I started medical school, I took some type of some type of a sociology class. I can't even quite remember what it was about, <laughs> but what I took away from this class, uh, I was like involved with communication. What I took away from this class was that we have to acknowledge that most people, um, and this is you know irrespective of race, most people um, do not have an extremely elevated literacy level, right? Like we are talking fifth grade is is really where a lot of people are sitting, to no fault of their own, right? It's just life in America in our education system, <laughs> and so how can I? talk about this condition, you don't know what this word means because this college educated person doesn't know what this word means. How do I discuss this with you in a way that you can tell me, um, repeat to me in your own words what's going on or that you can walk out of this door and actually do what's best for your health um, after our discussion and our shared decision making. So it is hard to communicate that well to a patient if I if I don't have the questions asked back. I want questions. And I think even if your provider doesn't seem like they want questions, demand those questions be answered. And I, I want to empower people of color to do that because that's probably the biggest determination on whether or not you can achieve your health goals if you can't 
um, be able to express what you are looking for and or express disagreement with your provider. Those are big. And that's something as an individual. Um, so similar to that, I, I think people should be or should feel empowered to ask their providers for alternatives, right? Or for um, another team member to join in their healthcare. Some, I'll give an example of what that might look like. If you're somebody that likes herbalist medicine, you like alternative forms of medicine in that way, there are professional um, alternative medicine providers and herbalists that can give you the right concoction, the right dosage, the right actual herb maybe that would not work against what your doctor is trying to do, but maybe give you a, an alternative that might add to what your doctor is trying to do. And it's not on, it's not on the onus of the patient essentially um, to have to seek those things out and try to put a team together like a puzzle piece when you have providers who can try to do that for you. Pain management is a, is a place I think a lot of people um, miss out on opportunities to do that because their providers aren't really thinking of connecting the dots and allowing them to have physical therapy, allowing them to have acupuncture, you know, those sorts of things that really might help. So if you're somebody that says, you know, I, I, I don't know if I really want to take all of these medications, but I also want to make sure that the science is there for my, for my health. How do I get my provider to connect the dots? Ask. You know, do you have somebody that can deal with pain that's not this pain pill? What can you do for me? And that, a lot of that, again, this is putting the onus on the patient, which is not really where a lot of the central issue or the, the central, um, you know, solution lies. But it's something that we can do as, as people of color or we can empower people of color to do. Ask your doctor questions and question what they're doing and try to get a team together that makes you feel more comfortable. Okay, so that's yeah. one thing. Hey, Ayana, I love that yeah. you, ask, you you dropped that question. I'm going to ask, is yes. there any way one can also ask about, because I'm thinking about folks that I know, who are African refugees, like, can you ask about like a culturally competent, like, approach, if you feel as though it's extremely Eurocentric and like, will I be heard or understood? Yeah, that's a great point, right? Because it provider dependent, they might not understand what you're asking, to be honest, right? But they also have the opportunity with all the technological communication that we have today, they have an opportunity to say, you know what, I don't 100% know the answer to that, but let me look that up and let me message you and, and try to do some research behind the scenes because we do that for all kinds of things. You know, we can talk to a patient and be like, never really heard that before. Let me get back to you after this visit is over, I'll message you. And so in the same way that we do that about medical devices or about this injection or this pill, we can do that for anything. That's our job, right? Is to figure out the way to get you to wellness, um, the way that you're going to engage with it. Cause there's no point in me giving you a medication if you're not gonna take it. <laughs> if that's not what you wanna do, then what's the point of me doing that, right? Like, let's find a way for you to try to get to this goal, this common goal together. Um, we might have two ideas of it, but we're gonna try to get there. So that is where I think, you know, we should not be as people of color afraid to say like, this is what I want. And even if you don't get the response you're looking for, you can also just say, uh, can I have another provider <laughs> who might do that for me? Um, I think another example of that is a lot of women, especially in Cleveland, you know, communities here and many communities around the country, a lot of black women are looking for midwife care, um, looking for midwifery as an option uh, that is not really as medicalized as um, an OBGYN. I don't take offense to that because I think there is absolutely a role and a place for our midwife colleagues who are incredible. And then midwife colleagues sometimes turn around and say, you know what, they have this health condition that I cannot deal with. Like, what do we do? And we have many times where a patient will is actually a high risk OB patient. They have a really um, complex or concerning medical problem. And we say, you know what, instead of just transferring care to us, if we feel like it's appropriate, how about I manage this medical problem and you manage the rest of their obstetrical care, if it's appropriate, right? Because that makes the patient feel more comfortable. It's more of a team effort and we're, it's not as um, paternalistic. You want your midwife, excellent. And I will, I will take care of your diabetes. You know, there's that sort of um, trade-off and you are allowed as a provider or as a patient rather to say like, what are my options? Can we, can we do this differently? Um, and then of course that leads me to the provider as an individual, what can you do? 
uh, in these situations to help your patient that's sitting in front of you um, that may or may not be the same culture or race as you, right? I think that being receptive to these sorts of questions, being receptive to the challenge is probably step one. Defensiveness is the, the last thing <laughs> that will combat structures of racism because then, you know, like you clearly don't want to do that. <laughs> you clearly want, you like status quo, right? And so getting defensive and thinking that the issue is individual does not actually help the systemic problem because we know this is systemic, right? Like I too can contribute to this as a black provider if I think that don't question me, you know, I know what I'm talking about. No, no, I haven't lived in your experience in your community in your body. So we're going to work together on this. So being receptive to questions, being receptive to knowing that a team approach is the best approach um, in almost any medical condition uh, and listening to what your patient is actually asking you for. And then of course, like I said, recognizing when your actions are perpetuating racist structures. So, you know, you thinking that, hey, the way that my white attendings and the white administrators have, have taught me is the only way, maybe that's not, maybe you need to examine why you think that they're the expert, you know, in a community that is not theirs. Um, and it's, it's very challenging to do that as a provider. It's challenging to do that as a teacher in a black community when you're not black. It's challenging to do that as a politician when a lot of your constituents are black and you're just, it's frustrating, right? Because you, you maybe might be well-intentioned, but the action is really what makes the difference, right? And the understanding is what makes the difference. So being receptive and knowing that, hey, I too, even with the best intentions can contribute to this. Then, you know, moving forward through that is if you can demand justice for your patients, for your students, for your constituents, whatever it is that your role is, you can demand justice in your colleagues. Um, that's another level. So it's like, I'm addressing this in myself. But when I see something that I think is maybe, um, you know, I, I need to make a moment here and say like, hey, can we examine why this might have impacted this patient this way? Why did this patient get defensive and yell at you? This isn't about you, but this is about the actions that maybe contributed to this patient feeling this way. I've seen that numerous times um, and I've seen it addressed and I've seen it not addressed. And I think part of being intentional is addressing it because you can do that in a professional way, especially if you and the colleague are like culture concordant, right? Like if you are a white woman and you see a white woman doing something, you can say, hey, hold on, wait a second. Like, do you realize how that sounded? Did you realize what that looked like to that patient? Or I suspect that patient was feeling this way because of this conversation with your colleague, with your peer, um, where there's no power dynamic is a really, really great way to start opening people's eyes if for nothing else. Um, I think that's, that is a big one is, is kind of looking in the mirror and then also checking the person next to you, um, particularly when you know that you are in an equal power dynamic with that person. Um, and that, that goes across the board, but in medicine, I think it's huge because we spend a lot of time with our coworkers and kind of know, um, how and when the things that they're saying and doing can, can really shift how a patient engages with the care moving forward. And then recognizing when we need experts, so particularly community experts, right? You know, do you live in the community that you are providing care? Probably not. And if that's the case, then you might act not actually know what's going on or the conversations or the, the energy that is in that community about you as a provider or about your specialty or about this condition that you're trying to treat. And so working with, and this, this is the hard work, is trying to find community experts that you actually have a conversation or a relationship with that trust you and you trust them. That takes some time, um, but it, it it is the answer, right? It's like, we can't know what people need and we can't know uh, uh, how to help people or help ourselves if we're not in communication. If I'm, just, if I'm just in the office or I'm just in the OR and I only speak to you when you're on the table, that is not gonna be helpful moving forward because I'm gonna keep my beliefs and so are you. Um, and I think that probably is the hardest part because it requires vulnerability and it requires um, engagement and investment in the community, whether you live there or not. Um, so need, identifying community experts and actually having a relationship, a true relationship with at least one can help you start to understand what is best um, for you to do as a provider with your patients. 
And then, like I said, echoing that listening, 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 like most of it is listening <laughs> in a relationship, right? We know that any relationship, friendship, family, romantic, if you don't listen, <laughs> you guys aren't getting anywhere. There's going to be constant conflict. The same with the patient provider relationship. Doesn't matter if you see this person once a year or you see them, you know, every two weeks because they're pregnant and they're getting ready to have a baby. You, your listening skills make the world of a difference. There are so many times where a patient says, Dr. Smith, this is my birth plan. And I'm looking at the list and I'm just like 50% of this is not going to happen, right? In my head, I'm like, wow, nah, this is not it. <laughs> We're not doing any of this, right? But I, I affirm it, I listen. And then I spend a very small amount of time saying, okay, I will acknowledge, oh yes, we can absolutely do these things. And then the things that we can't do, let me just explain from my perspective of what I'm hearing, you know, why this is important to you and what we can do alternatively, because feasibly this is not it for you. As an individual patient, we cannot achieve this one. Um, and because I'm listening, I, and I could have just met that person, this happens all the time, I could have just met that person that day and maybe never see them again until they deliver or whatever. And I, I have to be able to hear the things they're not even saying and figure out why on this list they, they want like, you know, a natural, a natural childbirth with epidural, like whatever, you know, it's like, what are you looking for? And I have to like really hear you and understand what it is you're saying. And if you don't do that, if you're ready to talk every single time, you're not gonna really kind of understand and absorb those like cultural values that people are putting in front of you. And you might not get it with this patient, but if you're listening to everyone, you might start picking up on, wait, wait a second, you know, it, it's not that this person, you know, needs candles and a, a diffuser, but they're looking for some peace because peace is not what they have normally. And they're looking for peace in this room. So how can I ensure peace occurs in this stressful moment? Those sorts of things. Um, over time with, with deep listening, even if it's five minutes of listening, you will start picking up the pattern in your community um, and knowing that for that individual, you can address it, but it is probably something you're gonna hear over and over again with this group of people and why it's important. Um, perceptions, concerns, observations, these are all valid. There's nothing that anybody says to me that I think is like, this is so stupid. No, 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 it's coming from something. It's coming from your mother, it's coming from television, it's coming from your boy boyfriend, whatever. Like I had someone say to me one time, it was a, a father of the baby sitting in the room with this pregnant patient and he said, well, I heard that and it was, I'm already like, oh gosh, you're not the patient. But he says, well, I heard that pregnant women should only eat fast food. It's way better for their digestion and they should eat a lot of it. And, you know, it's like the, he did this whole speech about how you should not eat healthy food <laughs> when you're pregnant. And I'm looking at him and I'm looking at her. And what I heard was I am controlling and I'm, I'm telling her what to eat. And she's looking at me like, please help me. <laughs> like, please, please explain to him without judgment that I know what to do with my body. And that, it, that is a, a common theme in my clinic of, of uh, partners being less than supportive, if not abusive. And so there's this, uh, this conversation that needs to be had that's nonverbal and sometimes verbal about how do you acknowledge what's going on in the room and then say, you as my patient and this woman, you are my focus right now. And I'm gonna give you my opinion. And then I'm gonna throw in a little bit of what I know you'll probably do. You're not gonna not drink juice in your diabetic, but you can water down the juice. How about that? You came in today with juice and you've got raging diabetes, but just put some juice in the water for me and drink more water and get your flavor in there. You know, those are the things that I don't have a problem with drinking water, but you do. And maybe water doesn't taste good in your house. So I'm gonna try to give you a little bit of something to walk away with. So we're, we're on the same page together. Listening, acknowledging concerns and validating are huge. And that's probably 80% of the work um, and in across fields, but particularly in medicine and wellness. And then, if you are an individual who's doing a lot of research or authorship, partnering with um, Black and Indigenous people of color, like just 
putting them as authors. That is like another, and a lot of people here on this call who are doing a lot of scholarship and research and um, that is a big one because giving people the title and the acknowledgement, it means a lot. Um, it gives you a platform that you, you know, you're not assuming somebody's work just because uh, you are the person who's not. Uh, the the minority you are the person who is also bringing someone on the same level as you by giving authorship so that's another thing you can do as a provider and then lastly structurally so this is really I think where the money is right because this is where things start to happen and uh in a level where there's almost like mandates and things you must do. <laughs> and this is where people start to get representation. Um, like as an individual, you might not be able to change hiring methods unless you're the person hiring, but the structure in the institution can do those sorts of things, right? So for one, I think independent appointment of um, black and people of color in powerful positions in administration is step one, but really where the change happens is providing them the space and support to not just hold that position, um, but to voice concern, raise important changes, give them the tools so they're not shouldering all of the work of an entire department uh, when they get into that position. A lot of times you have situations, especially if you think of historical racism, right, where the people at the table don't look like the test subjects. The people at the table don't look like the communities, uh, you know, who the legislation is being written about. You start to put people at that table and you can't get those votes, right? You can't get that document written that redlines a whole community if half of the people at the table are saying, oh, no, 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 not here. Um, so putting people in that position, but also actually giving them power, actually giving them a voice and not making them do the heavy lifting on their own is the key. Because a, a title is a title, but really the, the, the muscle behind it is what makes change. Um, and also you can't sit at a table with people who look exactly like you and know what people who don't look like you are, are needing. It's just impossible. <laughs> and that again, goes regardless of race. I can't know what you know the Asian community is looking for. I can't know what the indigenous community is looking for um, unless that person is sitting next to me and saying, oh no, no, you have that all wrong. Um, so putting people at the table and empowering them. And then the hiring practices, I think that in medicine and in healthcare, which are so important, which is why I brought up midwives, is that it's not just the physicians that need to be people of color. It's actually in the entire spectrum of the team. Nurses, PAs, LPNs, midwives, all of these people who work together from the time you walk into an office and you sign in your name uh, for attendance basically until you get checked in, you see the doctor, you get your scans and then you leave. In all places um, in that interaction in the healthcare system, there need to be black people and people of color because it is not just a doctor issue. Um, doctors aren't the ones who spend the most time with the patients, it's actually the nurses, right? So if you have a hospital full of white nurses, it doesn't matter how many doctors you have, the nurses are the ones who are changing your dressings and putting in your catheters and giving you IVs. And they're the ones who probably make the biggest impact on your experience, right? So recognizing that it's um, it's not just, well, we need to have more black doctors. No, we need to have more black people in all steps of um, the system, whether it's walking in the door or leaving. Um, and so looking at how your representation looks across the board is very important for the institution. And if they're not willing to engage in that, they will not make change uh, by just changing the doctors alone. And then, Physical structures, this is something that, you know, I don't have any control over, but uh, really great examples of how this works truly, literally, structurally. Building hospitals or building clinics in a way that fits into a community that uh, improves access, that has community uh, stakeholders input, that looks the way that the community wants it to look. Maybe they don't want a clinic that looks like, you know, an ivory white tower. Maybe they want a clinic that looks like the school down the street and fits in and doesn't make people feel, you know, um, feel ashamed they're walking into a clinic or nervous because they're walking into a clinic. All of those things that physically the structure of a building and the structure of a hospital, the location, how accessible it is, how expensive it is to park there, all of those things um, play a role into whether or not somebody can access 
your services um, and can even feel comfortable walking through the door. And so I would encourage people who maybe are the architects or the community leaders who have the opportunity to give, uh, you know, sort of like voice their opinions on that. Those people can really make a huge impact on, um, you know, communicating what the mom who has six kids really needs. You know, she can't walk into this building if there's nowhere to put her kids, right? Like they got to play somewhere while she's getting a pap smear. Like, what do you do, right? And so those sort of thoughts about structure, which I'm not that great at because it's it's not my gift, but somebody knows how to build a building and where to put it um, and what to make it look like that really um, uh, is, serves as, as an anti-barrier. It serves as a, it destroys barriers for the people who are really trying to seek care. And then something that kind of connects, and this is probably one of my last points here is, and I, this is where I think my brain starts to go beyond the scope of my expertise and what I think is so beautiful about healthcare um, is that, you know, I spoke about literacy a little bit earlier and also about getting more nurses, doctors, those sorts of things, right? You can't have, edu you can't be a nurse without education. <laughs> you, you can't, you need the degree in order to, wear the badge and work in the institution. And a lot of it starts with high school, maybe I would argue elementary school to get children almost essentially, there's like a common term called pipelined into healthcare. Um, we have, you know, the Moderna vaccine for COVID-19 was uh, created by or really engineered by a Black woman. And without that PhD, she could not have created this vaccine, you know, to save lives for people. And in order to get a PhD, she had to go to college. In high school, she had to know she wanted to go to college. And in elementary school, she had to be on the same reading level as everybody else to get to college, right? And I think that looking at education as the tool for us to really break down a lot of these structures of racism across fields, healthcare, politics, you know, truly um, kind of spreading across many fields, education is the key. And I think until we realize that our children are, you know, the third graders are the place where we're losing opportunity in our communities or opportunity is being kept from us structurally <laughs> that if we don't start looking there at the elementary school children and figuring out how to um, how to prevent them from being prevented from getting the education that would empower them to do anything that they need to do or want to do that is really how medical care and health care is going to be changed because we can't pull from a pool that doesn't exist. You can't get more black doctors without more um, black people in medical school. You can't get more black nurses without black people in nursing school. And you can't get more thinkers administratively or even community leaders without having some history, without having the, way, the ability to write and read and do the things you need to do to be able to communicate effectively um, and make change. And so I think, really thinking about how structurally education is sort of maybe the foundation of all of this in medicine. Um, and that includes literacy for everyone else as well. Uh, I think is really a great place to start and a place for our brain to absorb a little bit of what we can do next and what next we can, uh, you know, sort of point ourselves towards and say, this is where we really need to fix things. I can't do medicine, but what I can do is education and politics and policymaking. And if I want to impact people's healthcare um, access and people's wellness, I'm going to start here. Um, and maybe that is with the children. Maybe that is with your 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 policymakers and your governmental officials who are funding our schools um, and figuring out a way to get us to a place where you know people are able to communicate with their physicians um, at a basic level and advocate for their own healthcare and then get providers up there who look like them. Um, so I hope that was. That that were that sort of uh, there's a lot of thoughts there, but I hope that, that at least gave there was something in there that gave you a little bit of thought and pause to say like oh I know that I can do this one thing or I know that I can communicate this one thing to someone who's a change maker and doesn't know it yet. Um, those small changes take a lot of effort, um, and even just one small change actually really does wave um, and impact a lot of people.
So I hope that made sense. Wow. <laughs> I hope Ayana, that. you are incredible. Thank oh, my, oh you so thank you. <laughs> I thank you for that. What a comprehensive um, discussion and presentation and knowledge. And I am, um, you know, the way you wrapped it up there at the end about education. I know that I have um, some of my colleagues here. I'm a teacher. Um, you know, talk about what 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 you're gonna leave with from this discussion, right? Mm -hmm. I feel a charge to mm -hmm. really go back and um, check in with myself and how much I'm doing to ensure that there are more uh, black and brown doctors and, and, and nurses and so on and so forth. Because we, we do, and we are impacting, so to speak, the, the trajectory of, of um, a more diverse workplace. Mm. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I don't know, do you have any time for like just brief questions here? Yeah. Oh yeah. I would love for the community, if you guys have some thoughts or something you want to to ask her to please feel free to ask. I do. Um, thank you so much. Um, I and I, I, you know, I wanted to reflect what, what Trey just said and what you said, and and really kind of the sense of distrust um, with all authority, right? That we were experiencing here, and as adults on this call, and with doctors, and and how we talk with children about that distrust, you know, the examples that we set, right? Um, whether it's with politicians or it's with leaders or it's with doctors or nurses or whatever it is, children are sponges. They're soaking up this stuff. If we're giving them distrust when they're in third grade, second grade, they're not gonna go be a doctor if we're telling them to distrust doctors at that point. And I was just, so I just wanted to kind of reflect that. And I guess it's not really a question, but just a, uh, an observation. So thank you so much for everything. And I'll, I'll shush. Yeah. So other people can talk. Thank and you. That's an incredible observation because really like, I feel like what got me here is I had parents that um, were probably like, my dad was low key black Panther E, right? Like he was, he was not letting me not question the world. Right. And he's also someone that, and my mom as well are people that said, speak up if you have a question ask that and if you don't like how something looks well what do you think would be a better solution and a lot of that is is saying to children like no you you can do this you know you too have the power to be at the other side of the table and if your idea is good run with it and if you don't like it ask you know challenge respectfully right like there's a way to empower children excite children to look long term and say Hey, I, I can do that. I can make a better car than that person. And I can, I can teach better than that teacher I didn't like or whatever. <laughs> you know, there's there's always a way to get a child to say, I can, I can be what I see or what I don't see and do it better, or be inspired by what I'm seeing and 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 match that and be that. And I think, you know, education is such a hard place to be um, because there's a lot working against children um, and even working against college college educate like you know the students in college even it's not even just the third graders but people who are educating at all levels it's it is hard to inspire somebody or to you know bring someone out of the world that they're in and say like you can go beyond this um and and you can actually work in this and and be successful and have a career or whatever that looks like and so yeah it's almost flipping it from you know you can't do this to why don't you mm. Uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Hi, April. Hi, I'm a, I'm sorry. I'm April. I'm a, um, a parent to one of the students. <laughs> and I want to say thank you. And I appreciate the fact that you remind us to ask questions, right? Because a lot of times, um, if we're not sure, or we just want to have a um, alternative to what is being offered. It is very important to ask questions. And we, for, we do forget about that. We yes. do. And mm -hmm, it is. And the other piece is I do want to piggyback off. Um, we do also forget about um, encouraging, I'll say for me, my children to become and um, someone in a medical profession, a nurse or a doctor. And as you were saying that, I'm like, hey, why didn't we ever think of that when we're always trying to think out the box to do something different for our 
children, right? Our community. So I want to say thank you because we do have grandchildren coming up. We still have our 11 year old. So there's still hope for someone in the family to look, you know, into the medical realm, right? Or to hopefully want to tackle that. Right. <laughs> so thank you. Oh, you're welcome, April. And even, I think it's even important to if someone doesn't want to be in the medical field, right, mm -hmm. to be someone who thinks about what is being offered to them and has conversations right. about it, even in their own family. I have a lot of, right. I know a lot of people who during this pandemic had conversations, who are not in medicine at all, but mm -hmm. were great enough to have the conversations in their family and say, why, why are you getting the vaccine? Tell me about that. Or, you know, mm -hmm. why are you going to the club? Because I thought, right. <laughs> you know, it's like just asking those questions in your own family and being somebody who can challenge or encourage in your own mm -hmm. family is big. Um, you know, yeah. hey, I know you, I know we, we like to eat this. Would you mind if I cook it this way for you and show, right? Like there's something about the who can do that. Yes. Right. Right. I'll be honest. So I tested positive for COVID on, you know, I have my whole theory about that. Mm -hmm. And since this whole pandemic, we have been doing things a lot differently, right? So they gave me a prescription, right, <laughs> of three blue pills that are still sitting there. <laughs> and I just want to say I took it back to earth, okay? And I was just low energy for about three days and had been fine since, minus the congestion. And I'm like, okay, and the three pills are still sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> so I get it. Thank and, you. <laughs> and a doctor, a healthcare provider should be able to understand and accept that and work with you mm -hmm. because that's, that's really right. what it is. Our, our recommendations are just mm -hmm. that. And we want to, we want people to be right. happy whether they agree with us or not. So I, I appreciate your courage and, you know, choosing what you, mm -hmm. what you wanted to do to heal yourself and working with healthcare providers and knowing your body. Yes. Thank you. And I wish more of them were like you because they're not. <laughs> I'll just leave that there. <laughs> and that is the charge to the provider. There, there's a lot of work for all of us to do. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you. Eva, did you have something? Yeah, well, I wanted to say, Dr. Smith, I want you to come live near me because I want you to be my <laughs> OBGYN and, and whatever else, right? <laughs> You're too far away. Um, but as, a, as a, I'm a, a consultant, an educational consultant, I staff develop around the country. And so much of what you're saying, um, you know, rings true. And, and we, we try to bring so much social justice, try to speak about the inequities and um, I mean, even bringing books. Like, I mean, I was reading just this afternoon with middle schoolers, you know, that Carol Boston Weatherford is telling the story of Fannie Lou Hamer. And inside of it, one little page of it speaks about how in 1961, a doctor tricked me into an operation supposedly to remove a growth. I awoke from surgery to find the doctor's knife had cut more than my tumor, you know, and, and had removed the parts that got God had given me. And that's this stuff that gets unearthed. You know, we teach the kids so much. We feel like, I feel like I'm adding in all like, like lost culture, the, the, the missing, the changing the whitewashed history. But, but even that, like, I don't bring up enough of the medical aspects of, of who's, who's been minoritized and, and what's the abhorrence that's, that's happened. So um, it was wonderful listening to everything that you had to say today. And I, and I will, I will, I will raise it more so in terms of the medical, you know, acknowledgements and, and, and history that, that just is less, it's less known. You Thank know? you for doing that really, truly, because I, I remember being in middle school and going home and saying to my mom, she always laughs about this. She was like, you were crazy. But I went home and said to her, I was like, mom, why, why in English was my favorite subject. It's probably still my favorite subject. And I said to her, like, where are the black authors? I was in like seventh grade. I think I said like, I don't understand why we're reading, like where, I don't get it. Like where are the classical black authors? And my mom was like, go and ask your teacher tomorrow. And there, it was, she was an older white woman, like literally retired like the next year and she was like Ayana that's a really good question and I am ashamed to say I don't I've never compiled a list of black authors right like this was you know 2002 or whatever and I was like 
I've never compiled a list and I'm ashamed to say that. And thank you for asking me. And of course she was like ready to retire. So it didn't really matter as much for us, but it, it made me think like, wow, like these, these children now probably have a lot more exposure to hidden history than we did. Um, th that is like a hidden historical fact, right? People like heard about Fannie Lou Hamer and I'm so glad you brought that up. And she was, you know, she was sterilized without yes. her consent. Yes, Honestly. she was one of 20 children, my goodness, right? And, and now is a civil rights leader. And we don't know that about her, that right. someone literally did this to her. And a um, lot of medical atrocities like, like this um, are purposefully hidden, right? Like I did not know about the, the history of gynecology until I had already applied to be an OBGYN. Like it was, it was, you know, I, had I known that it wouldn't have changed my course, but I think I would have dug even deeper, even deeper, you know, right farther back. Um, and so I appreciate you inspiring your, you know, your, your children here to think about things that are not explicitly written <laughs> and to even talk about those things. Cause one thing about kids is they'll talk about stuff like they will, you know, you will. Up, they'll talk about it. So bringing up tough issues in children allows them to, you know, at least think about over time, like, wait a second, that's right. not right. And right. why does that not feel right to me? And what can I do about it moving forward? And those are the people who are curious enough to say, hmm, I'm actually going to do something about this. Mm -hmm. um, or, wow, I appreciate this just and that's just where it is, but I know about it and I appreciate it. And that even is life-changing right there. So thank you so much for doing that. You're welcome. Okay, we're gonna give time for like two more questions real quick. Ayana, thank you so much. And then uh, Amanda will make an announcement here for us. Again, thank you all for joining us tonight and we'll just leave room for two more questions or comments and then we'll head out. Sure. Uh, can I speak? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, hi. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the museum for, uh, yes. that's, that's where I saw the email that came through um, for uh, for tonight's presentation. And as an OBGYN, I got to love that shirt you got on. Thank you. <laughs> that is the, so much. the perfect <laughs> one. Um, actually, I, I work for the American Red Cross. Um, and the founder of our entire blood program, Dr. Charles Drew, was mm -hmm. an African-American who did all blood typing. And, you know, a lot of our stuff uh, really, really comes from that. I, I live in Fairfield. I'm a, God, I guess about a fifth generation Fairfielder. Um, but the presentation was terrific. Oh, thank um, you. We're trying to do a little bit more, you know, inflection as well, I think, at the Red Cross of, you know, how do we reach out to communities Besides, you know, the community that learned how to swim, uh, what I actually handle is I handle all the aquatic um, life-saving and uh, resuscitation programs for Rhode Island, Connecticut, and part of New York. So, you know, how do we reach out to folks that, you know, don't, don't look like me, <laughs> I guess you could say, and where if we were to say, okay, we're going to run swim lessons, well, what are the other obstacles that are there? Is it also that their parents don't know how to swim? Or that there, you know, are there other background medical issues where you'd brought up that, you know, is there something going on there more than just, okay, here's the, here's the program, come on down. <laughs> uh, can we do something that'll get people to come? Because, you know, there may be a historical issue in the background of, you know, it could be a transportation issue. It could be anything, <laughs> I guess, that, that's preventing. Um, so, you know, even for the state of Connecticut, I've been on a task force dealing with drowning prevention of minority students or minority children. Um, and uh, so seeing this tonight, I, I really thought it was a, you gave a great presentation and uh, I'm hiding in my basement for my wife and daughter with my COVID beard. So, uh, but uh, no, thank you. Thank you very much. This is the first one of these I've ever done with the museum and I'm, and I'm, and I'm really, really happy I did it. Oh, I'm so glad you joined. And it's as soon as you said swimming, I was like, wow, there are so many things to say here, right? Because like, what an excellent initiative. My parents actually very purposefully put me in swim lessons very early and was like, you will not drown. <laughs> like, swimming is important. And like me and my siblings swim a lot. There's a couple of things just to, to bring up on that. There's a couple of historical things I can just really rapid fire talk about with that. For one, 
as soon as I heard swimming, I thought like, oh yeah, black people don't like to swim because like, you know, my head goes to slave shift, slave ships immediately. And it's like this idea of water being like sacred, but also really traumatizing. Um, you know, black people jumped into water to escape uh, slavery and chose death over transportation to the United States and, and threw their children overboard um, to prevent them from growing up in this type of environment and this type of atrocity. And that's like the earliest thought I could, like as soon as you said swimming, I was like, oh, that's it, right? And it's like that sort of thing that, yes, it's not like the child today even knows about that, right? That might not be like in their consciousness, but it's in their, in their bones, it's in their blood, you know, that idea that passed down from generation to generation, water has been scary and life-giving all at once. The other issue that I thought of is hair. <laughs> so when yeah, I was a kid, yeah, yeah, we've had that. a big one because when I was a kid, my hair was permed and my mom, like I had a whole routine and my school did swim lessons too, like for four years in Shaker. Ooh, you had to swim and my hair was permed and we had a whole routine and that's like a health issue in itself, in itself right? Like healthy yeah. hair, healthy scalp. And the idea that like we had to do this very extensive long routine is almost like a barrier for the mom who works double shifts can't necessarily like do that for her daughter's hair, like, or, or doesn't think they can, doesn't like feel empowered to do it all the time. And so these things that may not even seem related to health in any way, aside from access to pools, aside from knowing anybody in your family who's ever like gotten in a pool and swam a lap, it's like some of these things that are in people's bones and you know, kind of in their spirit and they have no idea why they don't want to get in the water. Um, some of that is like the same type of thing that we're combating with, you know, um, you know, women who have access to contraception and, and, and people with access to vaccines. So I'm so glad you brought that up because it's just equally as much of a public health mystery as to how to really break through with communities as any other issue. So I applaud you for really going forward with that initiative because it's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, that's it. You know, when it was, I don't know, however old, my mother said, get in the car, you're going to the Fairfield YMCA, and you're going to learn how to swim. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> and there was no option there. So when, when I sat down, you know, with other folks and said, why haven't you? done this it's you know is it like you said there's either a an institutional issue there's a, a safety issue there's an exposure issue there's there's multiple things that lead to that and then something like drowning is a leading cause of death for small children and especially for minority children so right. okay. yeah but thank you yeah Jack, i'm so glad wonderful job <laughs> i'm so glad you found out about the event i'm really happy about that thank you um hey, anybody else have any questions i yeah, um, I have a question. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi, Hannah. Hi, Hannah. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm okay. So um, being a nurse, um, I just remember going through nursing school and um, just in my nursing fundamentals textbook, my med surge textbook, my anatomy textbook, um, it really being sticking out, seeing things like, um, diabetes, high blood pressure, certain types of cancers, um, being, um, more prevalent in African-American communities in Hispanic communities in indigenous communities. Um, and really, if I, I guess if I didn't know better, if I wasn't, you know, exposed to different things, or I didn't, you know, go, you know, I guess grow up in Shaker. Mm -hmm. um, I would think that this was their fault. And I think that unfortunately that continues to be the thought with nurses and doctors um, in the healthcare setting that this must have been brought on by a black person or a Hispanic person having high blood pressure, having diabetes. Um, and it never really talks about why. And so I'm just curious, um, in medical school and in your residency, um, do you feel like the providers you're working with are open to understanding why or where this may come from and why it's more prevalent in certain communities? Why um, things like allostasis and, and, and just racism. And as you said, generation to generation, kids may not 
you know, think back right now about slave times and a slave ship, but for some reason, the, the thought of water may instill like some fear. Mm-hmm. I mean, that could be with anything really. Right. So I just, I, I'm trying to have hope for the future in medicine, you know, working in a hospital and seeing, um, discrimination right in front of your face. And so I'm hoping, you know, with each generation, things may change and, you know, doctors may be more willing and nurses may be more willing to see that. So I'm just wondering what your experience is with that. That's an excellent question because I think there's a little bit of like, um, uh, there's a conflict, right? I think there's some providers who are, they just, you know, it's our nature as healthcare providers to say, I really want to know the answer. Like, why is this happening? There has to be a gene. There has to be like something going on that is causing this thing. And so in one way that has led a lot of people to sort of like misassociate uh, certain conditions or certain like treatments um, with race. And we know like race, there's there's another book called Race in a Bottle um, that kind of talks about how pharmacology has been linked to race in this way that's very dangerous. And like almost it's something called um, personalized medicine where they'll, you know, a pharmaceutical company will say like, this medication is for black people in high blood pressure. And this medication is for white people. <laughs> and that is, a, that is a thing. And that is like, there are medications that are like, this is what you give with black people in high blood pressure. And this is what, you know. And I think where like that has really born out of this idea from my personal experience of people just wanting to have an answer and like find something that can help. I think like a lot of it is good intentioned and it's not necessarily like it, not from the pharmaceutical level because that's all about money. But like, I really think a lot of doctors say like, I really just want to know why and I want to fix it and I want to point at this one thing. The other side is that for people who just do not acknowledge that like race is a contributor to anything and they think it's like, oh, this is a behavioral problem and this is because you eat this food and all of that. They're missing, for one, they're not reading research because we have research on various like health conditions that really do identify disparity and not just by race, like, you know, as a, as the fault, but race as like the consequence of society, right? We know that For example, black women have worse outcomes um, and black children have higher rates of infant mortality than other races, even controlling for finances and controlling for education and controlling for all these other things that are like behavioral. Um, And so it's like, you have a rich black woman and look at Serena Williams, right? Look at these people who have all the money and all the access in the world and something is still there that's causing them to have all these consequences. And the answer is racism. And that is really hard for people to digest because what does that mean, right? Like there's nothing to point your finger at. There's not one thing. And I think that what's challenging is when you have people that refuse to like put all those pieces together and say that there's something I can't touch and figure out what it is, but I also know that I'm probably contributing in like this like grand scheme way to this black patient sitting in my office with high blood pressure and diabetes. And you know, it's the people that encourage me that are the ones that can verbalize that and say like, this is racism. And then also I'm not going to look at this person and say like, oh, it's because you're black. So I guess there's nothing we can do. And instead say, you probably have this because of like generations of whatever has happened to you and your people. Here's how we're going to approach this and get you to a place of steady state health, right? Because I can't fix what happened in like 1776 and I can't even fix what happened in 1996, but I can sit there with you and say like, let's just try to get this under control so that we can impact your generations, right? Like let's let's try to work this out for you and your and your offspring and your people you know, your people in your household. I am encouraged though, because I do think that people are starting to get that language in their body. I think providers are starting to say like, you know, this is from systemic racism. It's not everybody, right? It's, but there are people. And and I think it also depends on region, right? Like if you're living in a place where there's no black people at all, and people are just like those lazy blacks over there are just eating fast food, then you're probably not going to be surrounded by colleagues who are really like engaged in that and challenging what they're reading. But then, you know, if you live in a place that's very diverse, you go to Queens, New York, you got a lot of different types of people. And so you might be having those conversations a little bit more. The challenge when you live in a place where there's less um, conversation like that is to be the, be the person, 
you know, and do as much reading as you can. And maybe that's not academic journals, maybe it's medical apartheid and race in a bottle. Um, but you know that the patients that you impact as an individual are going to, you know, have a, some type of positive result from the care that you can give. Um, I just hope that we start to accept more people into nursing school and medical school and dental school and all these things that are really paying attention to the world and are reading real academia that doesn't blame people of color for their issues. Um, but you're right, it is very discouraging and really tough uh, to get a whole entire system to, to think that way, even when it's right in front of their face. But thank you for your work and for being a nurse. Like nursing is, nursing is the backbone of medicine to me. Like you can't function without the nurses. So I, I greatly appreciate you. And at least being somebody who can think beyond and, and think this way for people who do or don't look like you, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Ayana. Thank Ayana, you so much. I, thank you so much. I, I couldn't thank you enough. I know that this was, um, it was a long, 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 uh, almost hour and a half. And uh, you came through for I me. I talk too much. <laughs> hey, I appreciate you though. You came through for me, you know what I mean? Um, in the 19th hour and I appreciate you for that. I don't want to take any more of your time. Uh, you've got so many great things to do. Um, thank you again for your time. Thank you for the information. And folks, I, I hope, you know, we commit ourselves to some of the, the small steps that Ayana has made suggestions of, and I've written them down. Um, but before we leave, if you can just please listen to Amanda, and we're going to try our best here to support another healthcare worker in our campaign to support Cynthia. Amanda? Yes, thank you. Dr. Smith, thank you so much for being with us. It was very, it was very, very interesting. And I'm going to be thinking about how you um, discussed the vaccine in terms of education and access um, for a long time. So thank you for that. Um, so uh, we have spoken about this GoFundMe page at all of our events, but I just want to remind whoever's still on the call, um, I put it in the chat. We are supporting. Um, one of Hannah's colleagues, Cynthia, uh, who has been a nurse for many, many years and was on the front lines of um, hospital work during the time of COVID and is now struggling with her own health issues. Um, and so we really wanna support her GoFundMe page and, and share it um, and really step up and support her. So thank you. Hannah, is there anything to add or is that? That's about it. I think um, Cynthia is suffering from breast cancer and she is going to start her second round of chemo, which is supposed to be extremely um, strong and very, very tough to get through. So um, I think most of these funds are really going to be put towards childcare um, mm -hmm. for her two young children. So I think that's really important just so she has time to recover and, and rest and not have to worry about that. So any, any help would be greatly appreciated. Great, awesome. So click on the link and then share it with people you know. And as always, you know, we do education and advocacy together. So just a reminder about that. So thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you all for coming and we will be sure to send this recorded um this recorded meeting to you guys as soon as we get it done yeah mm -hmm. thank you again ayana i owe you a lot thank you Have so much meeting, thank you